In this video, I will provide a brief description of the use of photolithography in the production of integrated circuits. Going from a VLSI circuit design to an actual circuit requires a lot of steps. And those steps are carried out of foundry. One of the important steps is photolithography. So I'm going to talk about that today. And, and also, let me describe some of the other steps that you can see where this fits in the process. It all starts with a silicon wafer, uh, shown in the top picture here. Uh, they come in either 300 millimeter diameter or half that size. And it's just pure silicon sliced half a millimeter thick from a bool of silicon, which is a three-dimensional long crystal of silicon. The finished product is shown in the picture below. After a bunch of devices have been planted on, so each one of these little squares that you see is going to go into a chip. It could be a, one of several things. There could be a microprocessor on there. It could be something simpler like a 555 timer. That's what you end up with, so we'll have to cut all that to pieces. In order to get those patterns on there, we need to have something that transfers it. And that would be a mask. So a mask is a piece of glass that has a pattern inked onto it. And that pattern is the actual pattern that you need to transfer to the silicon in order to fabricate the device. This mask has to be placed on top of that wafer. And it's done so with a clean room tool called a mask aligner. The reason why you need to use this is because that mask needs to be very precisely placed on top of the silicon wafer because you're going to have several masks during the entire fabrication process. And the next mask needs to have its lines line up very precisely with the silicon. There's a lot of optics involved in using this because this mask is actually considerably larger than the silicon and so it's followed by focusing optics that take the optics down to a much smaller dimension and needs to be observed with a, with a microscope. So once you've made one of these, a wafer that has a whole bunch of circuits on it, you need to get those circuits separated. For that, a dicing saw is used. And I'd show you a picture of a dicing saw, except it just looks like a cabinet. So instead, let me show you inside the cabinet. And, and actually, what I really like is this picture that I stole off of some video of a saw blade you know, cutting through a, a wafer. It's just, that's a nice depiction of what's actually going on inside of a dicing saw. You need to get little rectangles all separated and, and, and cut apart from each other because each one of them goes into a chip die. This has not been my procedure throughout this semester, but this lecture is filled with pictures I borrowed mostly from, you know, from Wikimedia, although this one came from a YouTube and I got another one from a company site someplace. So let's go through photolithography, which is in the middle of, of all these other processes. It has to be done. Suppose you want to make one of these. I have a silicon substrate. It's half a millimeter thick. I won't go through the dicing procedure. That we're just going to focus on the question of how do you get this. So I want to make this feature. This is a silicon dioxide meander line, just as a feature. 20 nanometers thick, and it looks like that. And that's all I want. That's all I want on my piece of silicon. How do I make that happen? I have six basic steps here, and of course there are lots of steps in between, and they can be broken down into lots of steps. But we're going to go through six steps. First one is to oxidize that silicon, right? You need to get a layer of silicon dioxide on top of that silicon. The silicon is you know, what I call substrate. It's a, a thick bulk piece of silicon, but I want this 20 nanometer thick oxide layer, which you get through thermalization. So you expose the silicon at a high temperature to water vapor, or you could expose the silicon at high temperature to just reactive oxygen. And, and both processes are used in foundries to produce silicon dioxide. So we've oxidized it. Now, I don't want a substrate that's just got a complete coating of oxide on it. I want a substrate that has this meander line. So the next question is, how do I take this film of oxide and turn it into just this shape? So we'll have to do photolithography. First thing you do is you cover it with photoresist. It goes on as liquid and it dries very quickly and becomes this polymeric coating, but it's, it's very uh, sticky stuff when it goes down. Usually it goes down like a spin coating. You spin that wafer around and around and around on something that spins, and, and yet you expose it to this atomized vapor of the photoresist liquid, 
and it coats it and like I say it dries very quickly but you usually then it goes into a drying oven to make sure it's really dried and so when it's dried on there it's a very hard coating on top of the silicon dioxide then you need to remove some of that photoresist and that's where the mask comes in so the mask gets placed on top of the photoresist coated substrate I depicted a dark line here because you know a you know, mask is really a piece of glass a piece of glass with ink drawings on it and so this dark line here is an ink drawing and you put it ink side down <laughs> onto the photoresist and you expose it to ultraviolet light this is what the mask aligner is for is you get that mask positioned right where it belongs and then the UV light gets turned on where the, the ink is on the mask the UV light can't hit the photoresist but where there's no ink on the mask the uv light passes in through the glass and into the photoresist now what happens next well the photoresist changes chemically when the uv light hits it what we need to know is what happens to the properties of the photoresist it breaks down the photoresist breaks down it's very hard stuff after it comes out of the drying oven the whole photoresist coating is extremely hard and will resist acids and reactive vapors and, and things but the uv light weakens it breaks it down makes it something that will crumble easily I mean, it basically makes it something that will be washed away by a caustic solution, which is what happens next. You then you develop the photoresist, remove the, remove the mask, and then soak this whole thing in a high pH uh, liquid, which will remove any of the photoresist that was exposed to ultraviolet. But the photoresist that was not exposed to ultraviolet, man, that stuff is hard. You should just see how these coatings, when they come out of the drying oven, they're just, these photoresist coatings are very hard. The shape of the photoresist that remains is the shape of the feature you want to make. So our mask would have had a black ink line on it that followed this pattern. And that's now the, the photoresist. There's this photoresist on top of the silicon dioxide that looks just like that. You can etch it away. If you take this product and put it in some dilute hydrofluoric acid, which is, by the way, not really the preferred way these days. It's, it's an old way of doing this. I'll talk about a preferred way, but it's easy to understand, I think. You take this and put it in, in hydrofluoric acid, the HF will eat away the silicon dioxide. It'll eat away the substrate, too. So you got to be careful how long you do this. <laughs> so the etching time has to be actually correct. It will eat away the silicon dioxide, and you just leave it in there long enough that it eats down to that point, so you have exposed silicon again. But it won't touch the photoresist. So now you have that. The reason why HF etching is not really preferred anymore is it has a tendency to also eat away the silicon dioxide from the sides, and that's not a very controlled thing. And so I'll illustrate some better ways of doing it these days. Once you have this, you can say you have this pattern, except it's still covered with this really hard coating that uh, you don't want to keep around. So you wash it away, which you can dissolve it in most solvents. In fact, so you you do that. You just take this now and and, and wash that photoresist off with a solvent like acetone. It comes off, and you have then your silicon dioxide line on top of the substrate. You have this thing. You know, this is just a cutaway view, but if I took a 3D view, I'd see that. That's your photolithography procedure. The photo is the ultraviolet, which passes through the, the mask. And the ultraviolet is used to re reduce the diffraction around the, the mask lines. These days, we want to have lines that are 20 nanometers wide. That's a lot less than a wavelength of light. You have serious problems with diffraction around the mask. The way that's handled is to use shorter wavelength light ultraviolet then extreme ultraviolet and that's what you find in foundries these days is extreme ultraviolet being used for the light source so let me give you a few comments notes on the photolithography process just a few random things that i think are worth knowing about this and the first thing is that it happens in a clean room clean rooms are classified by how much particulate matter is in the air when you have all the HEPA filters turned on and uh, it sits up and running. So a class 10 clean room is a room where you have 10 half micron particles per cubic foot. That's the limit. 
If you have more than 10, then it's not class 10 clean room anymore. Class 100 clean room is the next category where you're allowed 100 half micron particles per cubic foot. And then there's a class 1000 clean room, class 10,000, and, and then there's your lunch room. Those are the categories. And there aren't very many class 10 clean rooms in the world. And I'm not sure this picture that I got from the NASA Glenn website is class 10 or not. I'm just taking a guess. Second thing, the photoresist. So I'm really going randomly here now. Let's go back and talk about photoresist. It's an organic polymer, photopolymer, that is. When it's exposed to UV, it, it breaks down. The photoresist comes in two flavors, positive and negative. Positive photoresist is overwhelmingly what is used in VLSI fabrication. But let's talk about the difference here. Positive photoresist will break down when it's exposed to the ultraviolet, and then it will be etched away. And negative photoresist is the opposite. And so actually, if you use negative photoresist, that mask also has to be a negative. I think overwhelmingly, uh, everything's positive in foundries. Then there's the developer. How does it work? The developer washes away the broken down photoresist, which is uh, you know, not hardened because it, it goes down hardened and, and you unharden it with the ultraviolet. And then finally, the etchant. This is important because there are really two ways of etching it. I mentioned there's hydrofluoric acid, which is not so much the preferred method. It gets its use, but it's, it's not the preferred method. Then there's dry etching. So wet etching and dry etching. Dry etching uses plasma where you sputter the material right off the substrate. So you take the silicon dioxide layer and the photoresist has been hardened onto it. And instead of exposing it to hydrofluoric acid, you expose it to a reactive plasma like chlorine or fluorine. Then the atoms in that plasma will sputter away the silicon dioxide that's not covered with photoresist. The reason why that's the method of choice is it avoids that thing where the sidewalls get etched away. So that's over etching. If you cover your silicon dioxide with photoresist, what you want is to be left with a silicon dioxide block that has a wall right here. But what you get is, is something else. HF might eat away underneath it. And that's referred to as etch bias, which is actually a quantified amount. How much etch bias you have is this big T. It's, it's how much underneath the photoresist uh, you etch. And it's important because what you end up with then is, is a line that's narrower than what you designed for. That can be taken into account if you know what the etch bias will be. And you can actually go ahead and make your mask slightly wider to get that. But in dry etching, all that is avoided. And you know, it's still undesirable because that's not the shape you want your edge wall to be. Uh, you want a, a vertical wall. I have depicted uh, dry etching down here where you have your substrate, you have your, your silicon dioxide layer or whatever it is you want to take away, and your photoresist that's been uh, developed, that is the hardened stuff is left behind, you expose it to uh, the plasma, the uh, chlorine or the fluorine plasma, it will eat away the film, but only where it's not covered with photoresist, and then when you're done you dissolve the photoresist and you have your finished product. That's photolithography. It does fit into a larger set of procedures used to fabricate a finished circuit. And this is a block diagram of it, beginning with oxidizing your silicon. And then there are all kinds of steps. There, there are deposition steps. There are putting a mask on there. There's doping, boron implantation to get a dopant in there. And there's more oxidation. And there are more masks to make your gates, your source in your drain. And, and uh, you need to diffuse or implant ions while well, you implant them and then you heat them up to diffuse them in. That's our coming up topic. And then now you have more oxidation, more mask, you know, in order to get metallization and bonding pads and, and all those steps until finally you have a finished process. That's a summary of it. And photolithography is happening throughout this whole process. So there are several photolithography steps every time there's a mask. There's photolithography. In this particular outline, we have five mask steps. We're going to talk about how the dopants are put in there, because I think that's particularly of interest to us. There's the ion implantation and the diffusion. And as you can see from here, both can be used in tandem. They're not necessarily used one or the other, although that too is possible.